Welcome everyone to the Peace and Justice Studies Association Conference for 2020. We're meeting online this year and we have a wonderful range of offerings and um, that, that follow a particular sequence of topics. In September, we're focusing on restorative justice. In October, we're focusing on storytelling and narrative. And in November, our focus will shift to polarization. So these topics are all relevant to the times that we're in, and we hope that you will all benefit from learning about these subjects as we do as well. My name is Amanda Smith Byron, and I'm the research chair for the Peace and Justice Studies Association and a conference committee member, and I'll be facilitating today's session. And uh, Swasti is my colleague who will be assisting in the facilitation and her cat's tail will also be providing <laughs> some entertainment to us as we go through our session today. Um, before I introduce our panelists and the topic of today's session, I'd like to turn it over to Swasti, who will invite us into a, a remembrance of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So as all of you have probably know by now that Ruth, ba Ruth Bader Grin Ginsburg died yesterday. And I think many of us have just been a celebrating her life and thinking about all that she has done and how she's provided for us examples of how to fight and i read one quotation where she says we should stand for justice we should fight but do it in a way that we have others join us and that's something i think that's really important and, and necessary for today's world so i there was a lot of different ways to do this and i thought one moment of silence where we could just think about her and think about ways that her life has influenced it, yours and or how you can then take some of the spirit of what she's done and carry that forward. So um, I'll let this person come back in. So we'll start with a moment of silence. I'll ring this bell. I have my timer so that I don't go over time and then I'll ring it again at the end, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. May her memory be a blessing. So today, this session is entitled Vulnerabilities of Somebodyness in Restorative Justice Theory. It's a very provocative title. I'm excited to see what we're going to be discussing today. And all three panelists are editors of the ACORN, Philosophical Studies in Pacifism and Nonviolence. Uh, Greg Moses comes to us from Texas State University. Sanjay Lal comes from Clayton State University, and Anthony Neal comes from Mississippi State University. So I'll invite them to give a more detailed um, introduction to the, themselves and the work that they're doing as we begin our panel on vulnerabilities of somebodyness and restorative justice theory. Um, I'm not sure who's going first. Have you decided amongst yourselves? I think, uh, was Anthony set to go first? Okay. Yes. Great. So Anthony, okay. thank you for being here. We appreciate your presentation already. Thank you. Again, I'm Anthony Neal, Associate Professor of Philosophy and also Fellow in the Honors College at Mississippi State University. Um, and my most recent book, uh, Love Against Fragmentation, is uh, on the philosophical mysticism of Howard Thurman. <laughs> um, 
my topic today, New Directions in African-American Philosophy for the Study of Doctors Howard Thurman and Martin Luther King Jr. And in order to set some groundwork, I, I wanna say two quotes that each gentleman used. Um, Howard Thurman quoted Thomas Carlyle when he said, it was once and has always been a serious thing to live. Martin Luther King in his last speech said, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. In 1958, Martin Luther King Jr. was stabbed by a woman with a letter opener and nearly died. It was during this time that Thurman visited King and told him that he was at risk of being swallowed up by the movement. King took an extended rest after this period and later the next year, King was asked to give a talk at Purdue University for the United Churches of Christ, the subject of which would be a book entitled The Measure of Man. In these 12 speeches, King wrestled with the existential questions of life and attempted to provide a metaphysical grounding from which questions could be launched, such as how might a person live? Or what is worth the risk of death? The amount of personal contact the two men shared in this time is not known for sure, but what is known is that there was a, great, a general familiarity each man had with the ideas of the other. However, such questions are not important to my contextual motives today. My concern is with the value that the adequacy and applicability of the philosophical notions lifted from the two might have for those facing oppression, given that there seems to be parallel and congruent ideas in their works. In my previous writings, I have had a lot to say about the proper manner in which to view or understand the intellectual production of Howard Thurman and others of his milieu, inclusive of Martin Luther King Jr., is through the frame of the modern era from 1896 to 1975 and the freedom gaze or the African freedom aesthetic. This is well documented in articles and books on the subject. My writings demonstrated my contention that a new era came into being, a new era of black struggle and the birth of an African-American phenomenological tradition or philosophy focused upon self-definition through a host, uh, honest disclosure of what is the meaning of blackness stemming from the reflective activity of those black by law at the dawning of the 20th century. The importance of this contention is not that one meaning was put forth. Certainly there were many meanings put forth, but the importance of this particip participating in this reflective moment uh, of thought is that it was important to reject the lived experience created by slavery or oppression and that an affirmation of the desired experience should be put forward, which extended from the minds of black people as they ushered in their own modern era. From where does the meaning and value of life arise? It, if, this, if the world is as it is, and that is all that it is, for what do we live and for what will we die? The distal reality of freedom in the world has narrowed, for some owing to the upward economic and class mobility, but still remains for many Black people experientially afar. Though we are beyond the modern era, Du Bois makes reference to this phenomenon through his now famous phrase, between me and the other world, there's an ever unasked question, how does it feel to be a problem? Elaine Locke's dismay concerning the loss of African-American folk culture presents his own analysis of the phenomenon as such. The high cost of prejudice to which we all had all but become accommodated is now being compounded by the high price of integration. Thurman turns inward and asks, what does it mean to grow up with a cheap self-estimate? And King pushes further still with the inquiry by asking, why does misery constantly haunt the Negro? But what does this reality require in order to survive and flourish? from the individual which, uh, who experiences the re this reality by virtue of moving through the matrix of blackness, making them at once the birth of all black possibility and the stone that the builders of the present reality have rejected. This is a complicated existential quandary, one that is exceeded in complexity by the repetitive dystopian vision of those that make this existentially reflective thought experiment necessary. Survival 
and the desired experiential counterpart of flourishing requires an effort and an educative experience for which the traditional education provided by the state rarely, if ever, makes available unless some exceptional instructor goes beyond the normal curricular bond, bounds. Excuse me. So what then should be done? Charles Mills, another philosopher, African-American philosopher at, the, at CUNY, suggests that if we want a significant change in our society and of necessity, a change in the members of our society, we should appeal to sources whose aim was significant change. Here I'm simply making a case for the significance of appealing to those who made an intentional effort to transform themselves so that they might be equal or to or greater than the existential challenges of this oppressive moment, ultimately setting in motion a type of societal transformation. King and Thurman are two such individuals who recognize the requirement for existential transformation by those individuals who face the challenges which the oppression of blackness bore. And because of these challenges, they made an effort to transcribe what they understood to be ways others might engage in the same transformation. In an effort to both expose their transcriptions on the matter and to also conclude this treatise when, within a reasonable length, I will, have, I will here only provide brief comments on their mode of thought and also offer a summative determination concerning the meaning of their writings on the matter for anyone interested in similar existential transformation. King and Thurman do not reach the same conclusions and therefore do not make identical statements about what might be necessary for this type of transformative move. But they do begin their process seemingly grounded in the same presupposition, which is the role of the individual, the role that the individual performs in their own becoming is significant. It is clear <clears throat> that they both attach freedom to the individual in that they believe the individual must exercise their ability to reason in order to transform and to live fully. If this is not done, then the individual simply is, but does not become other than the product of their experiences. Both the beauty and the problem of life is found somewhere in the interaction of the individual's ability to reason through the, the circumstances or experiences they are presented. Thurman speaks to the problem when he discusses the possibility of the individual being wrong in their commitment to their decisions. Also, this type of reasoning towards an existential transformation alone will not guarantee an end to such tragedies as slavery, war, or extreme poverty, but it goes a long ways toward the development and determination of individuals equal to the task of battling their circumstances in a substantive way, lessening the distance between lived and desired experience. King and Thurman both suggested that the existential transformation of the individual was infectious. For Thurman, the good community begins with the commitment of one individual to an ideal. In fact, he suggests that life itself carries within it an inherent commitment to continue with, which is demonstrated by all life forms going to the great lengths to survive. He uses the example of plant life with their roots digging far into, into the ground, even through other elements in search of water or the bending of plants toward the sun. He adds to this that life evolves because of this need to continue requires the development of structures or of patterns of behaviors to meet the conditions which guarantee that life continues. As this applies to humans, Thurman purports that there must be a conscious intent to commit to a certain aim. This begins by wrestling with three questions. Who am I? What do I want? And what will I do? That is, what will I do to get what I want? These questions form the crux of the existential crisis of meaning in human life and freedom to decide. There is the freedom to decide, but to this, Thurman adds the necessity of commitment. This commitment must be such that it surpasses what is seemingly possible in an empirical sense for the individual. Commitment in this sense approaches the mystical, pushing individuals to work towards causes, obligations, or goals where the fulfillment is so high that its full realization is not even in sight. 
and the individual realizes that they are only working towards their peace in a large whole. For King, this existential crisis is captured in the single question, what is man? Which can be restated to say, what is the value of human life? He wrote that the whole political, social, and economic structure of society is largely determined by its answer to the, this pressing question. Society can be changed by this question, but so is the individual. For in this question is contained the answer as to the worthiness of any commitment to life. These types of questions have as much import to how we become as they do to what we become. And by my time, I think I have about three or four minutes left. Um, <clears throat> recent trends in philosophy have led to radical interpretations of race and racism, and many attempts of making the, the possibility of radical revolutionary change visible. I do not think that the radical interpretation of race and racism is a vacuous activity. However, any proliferation of this course of intellection can be thought to resemble the, the pursuit of frivolous demurral by overstating the obvious. Radical revolutionary change is the lived experience, in the lived experience is usually the desire of any oppressed people who become aware that their oppression is not ordered by some transcendent cause constituting a universal order. This has been and will continue to be a working presupposition of mind. However, the condition that there exists an awareness of one's own oppression and to what extent one is being oppressed is simultaneously a deep cavernous gulf and an exorbitantly steep mountain peak to be overcome by those armed with only signs, symbols, frames, and experiences. The examination of the self and tools necessary for accomplishing this task are requisite before the creation of any radical revolutionary change can be had and sustained. By way of tools, I simply mean that those concepts that make ready the ability to properly self-reflect and self-criterion for living meaningful lives. In this section, I will identify the tools that both Thurman and King placed before us, giving close attention to the works Discipline of the Spirit by Thurman and The Measure of a Man by King. By presenting these tools, I will also demonstrate the presupposed necessity for the occurrence of the intentional transformative moment to ready the individual for the change they hope to be possible. King asks, what is man? And Thurman asks, who am I? In a performative gesture to utilize the tools of reflection in an attempt to get some type of realizable picture of their existential meaning. Although both men felt that any human should make some attempt to reflect on questions of this nature, neither man is merely asking the question untethered to their particular existential condition. In consideration of their social experiences and material conditions, which were mostly an extension of their social condition, this question or the question can be understood to encompass a wide berth of questioning such that an adequate position concerning their experience could be formed. Questions such as what meaning can be affirmed in spite of an experiential contradiction to whatever answer is, is put forward? What question, could have as its, <clears throat> what question could have as its goal the inclusion of both the oppression, I mean the oppressed and the oppressor into a categorical scheme such that an end to oppression of humans by other humans might become visible? In this attempt, a combination of tools are brought to the fore, and we are not only asked to consider the questions themselves, but we are also made to consider the questioning process. It is in this examination of the questioning process that the usage of other tools become identifiable. There's obviously the utilization of reflection and questioning, but there is also remembering imagination, intuition, rejection, defining, and arguing, laying out their positions before others leaving themselves open to critique, but also taking a stand concerning the meaning of their answers, basically why these answers are not and not others. It seems that each of these, and I'll, I'll finish up with this, it seems that each of these men knew that, that the damage done by oppression required more than a legal end to the, that oppression to bring out the possibilities for future 
for the future they each conceive. Their questions could be thought to be a basic, to be basic to that all of reparative or reparative notions. Essentially, we must ask the question, what damage was done to our humanity by virtue of living in an oppressive society that requires repair or reparations before any possibility of, grand, of a grand future can be developed? What ethical exceptions did we learn in order to navigate day-to-day -day living in the, this oppressive moment? When are these exceptions ever being questioned and by who? In these texts by King and Thurman, the requirement is presented to perform this type of reflective activity such that the individual can approach a good or at minimum an ethical aim. Thank you, that was gorgeous. A lot of information in a short period of time. I've got tons of notes and writer's cramp, but um, that's, I guess the nature of talking with philosophers, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anthony, for your presentation. And um, we'll hold questions to the end. If anyone would like to post any questions in the chat, that's a fine way to start. But we'll have a time for Q&A at the end of each of the um, presentations, at the end of the, all three presentations, rather. Great. Who would like to go next? I'll, right? I'll be happy to go. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I am uh, captivated by the work of Fania Davis. As a lifelong radical activist, uh, Davis began to seek a more holistic, spiritual way of being. Her journey led to indigenous spiritual practices of Turtle Island and Africa. In her little book of restorative justice, Davis argues that our social process of seeking justice in the face of wrongdoing must be pursued in a context of liberation informed by indigenous spiritual practices. This means in the first place that any approach to wrongdoing must be mindful of structures that criminalize. Confronting the implications of criminalizing structure, our comprehensive approach to restorative justice requires mindfulness of social trauma that runs deep and wide. We have to make revolutionary commitments to abolish the structures of injustice. As one student said to me earlier this week, in America, there never has been a clear or comprehensive acknowledgement of our founding traumas. And this would be one reason why Fannie Davis's comprehensive approach to restorative justice includes a need for truth commissions that can help us share a collective vision that would nurture critical race theory and liberation sociology. Tommy Curry's recent work in black male studies insists upon a complex regard for the ongoing trauma that envelops the life world of black men. On Curry's view, stereotyped views of black men as wrongdoers operates with precision to deflect any hint of outrageous trauma that black men undergo. Restorative justice, therefore, is called to show up at the site of wrongdoing but restorative justice restores the wrongdoing to a complex field of trauma. On this view, we can understand why a basic practice of restorative justice involves the convening of a circle. In the context of a circle, a wrongdoer takes their seat besides others, forming a spatial image of Ubuntu. I am because we are. We contrast that spatial arrangement to the courthouse hearing where a defendant stands alone before a singular instantiation of authority. The first lesson of the circle is that no one stands absolutely alone. In this sense, the circle joins issue with a long-standing critique of ideological individualism. We locate the source of the individualist ideology in the social contract theories of Hobbes and Locke, where which construct a so-called state of nature that is founded ontologically upon an array of socially disconnected individuals. And we locate the classic descent from this ideology in the theses on Feuerbach, especially theses 9, 10, and 11. Judith Butler's book on nonviolence gives recent expression to the movement of descent against the originary myth of individualism 
On Butler's view, who draws on the work of Freud and Fanon, our psychic attachments to individualism are so deeply embodied that a clean break requires something like a psychotic rupture. Indeed, Frank Wilderson's Afro-pessimism presents psychotic rupture as exactly the consequential price that one black man pays to escape the trauma of anti-black racism. In the move from Butler to Wilderson, we see that the ideology of individualism has been founded literally on the backs of black men. On Wilderson's account, the fully formed human that appears at the beginning of a Hobbesian or Lockean state of nature has already been underwritten by the oppressed and suppressed other. The energy needed to sustain this oppression and suppression is then sublimated into the project of being human. Wilderson and Curry converge here where the evidence proves that black people are simply locked out of the category of human and that black men are excluded from manhood. Structurally, Wilderson and Curry are also consonant with Enrique Dussel's critique of Cartesian leisure. At the specific point in time when Descartes takes a week off to meditate on the nature of his own ideas, he disconnects his mind completely from the people who have given up their lives, their land, and their freedom so that Europeans may experience the so-called nobility of their self-enclosed thinking. So yes, the circle refutes the ideology of individualism, but it also refutes the specific weaponization of individualism as it has been applied to adolescent boys and girls under colonial impositions. We make a grave mistake if we think that the ideology of individualism is actually practiced by those who deploy it. Descartes never asks where his mind gets the language to think with. It is usually plain to see who self-proclaimed individualists have depended upon, and you can always ask them where they got their belly button from. However, my point here is that adolescent boys who come from households of privilege are not criminalized as individuals when they get caught in wrongdoing. Historical documentation of this double standard can be found in Carl Sudler's recent book, Presumed Criminal, Black Youth and the Justice System in Postwar New York. Adolescents can pose outrageous challenges to social norms of propriety and legality. However, in neighborhoods where cultural capital is backed by securitized mortgage financing, and discrete contact lists, the norms of community demand that adolescent transgressions get placed back into the hands of parents or clinical experts who can request the favor of minimal engagement by criminal authorities. The restorative justice circle, therefore, when it is convened under specific historical conditions in Oakland, California, is a demand to make visible the kind of support that adolescents and other schools can already count on. This does not render the circle meaningless when it is adopted in more privileged spaces, but the appearance of the circle in time and space does mark a spot in a gravitational field of power and therefore becomes a profound practice of social liberation. Restorative justice circles are sites of negotiation where teachers and parents who love adolescents can find some shelter for their God-given relationships to the children and adolescents under their care. The restorative justice movement in Oakland moves against the ideology that adolescents should be treated as fully formed adults by those who love them. Because as an ideology, the view that adolescents are individuals is never really practiced except as a power tool. The film Circles documents Eric Butler's work with restorative justice circles in an Oakland alternative high school, bringing the viewer into cinematic intimacy with the crisis of adolescent life under pressure cooker conditions. The great subtext of the documentary lies beneath the name of the high school where Eric Butler worked. The school was named after Ralph Johnson Bunch. The documentary does not mention that Bunch joined the march from Selma to Montgomery in 1965 
or that in 1950, Bunch was the first black man to win the Nobel Prize for Peace, or that in 1936, Bunch wrote a path-breaking little book called A World View of Race, some 60 years before critical race theory became a meme. However, the viewer who is mindful of these things can see in the work of Eric Butler, a world transformative practice. We can see in the Circles documentary not only that Circles save lives and families, but also how the Circle is a fragile power that depends on saintly dedication and courageous institutional leadership. Restorative justice circles invite us to res resist structural injustice by organizing normal expectations that restore indigenous practical wisdom. And this is the second insistence that follows from the work of Fannie Davis. In the great Mayan classic, Popol Vuh, creation begins with a conversation. Already in the beginning is a council deliberation between the framer, the shaper, grandmother, grandfather, heart of earth and heart of sky. Correlative to the six sacred directions are six voices already in dialogue. The Popol Vuh goes on to warn us against any voice of authority that comes from outside the council conversation. In the beginning was deliberation, more recently rediscovered as deliberative democracy. The Popol Vuh takes us through various stages of creation as deliberation is enacted, as the results of enactment are observed and evaluated, and as deliberation moves to erase previous mistakes through innovation. The clay people don't work out, the stick people don't work out, and so the corn people emerge through a process of deliberative refinement. The Popol Vuh also centers its heroic figures in the form of twins. Here is no singular hero, but a pair of heroes in relationship. Hunapu and Shibalanke deliberate and plan their actions. They support each other. Through strategy and foresight, they clear the spirit world of impediments to moral flourishing. The council deliberation and the hero twins are classical themes of Turtle Island culture. Deliberative democracy and teamwork have not yet been colonized out of existence. In January 2019, students of the Oakland Roots Middle School organized a circle at a school board meeting in an effort to save their school from shutdown. In a video of the event produced by Circle's producer Cassidy Friedman and posted at Friedman's YouTube page, we see our Oakland peacemaker, Eric Butler, doing what he can to help organize the circle and to steady the spirit of it around the voices of the middle school students. The viewer sees how Butler makes an effort to establish a peer-to-peer -peer relationship between the middle school students and the Oakland board members. Both the power and the vulnerability of the process are on display. Another YouTube posted by Friedman in April 2013 documents a restorative justice reentry circle at Bunch High School that brings together a student, his family, friends, and educators who surround the student with support after his release. Here we see Eric Butler explaining the use of a talking piece that is passed around the circle to designate a speaker. It gives everyone permission to listen, Butler says. The process of the talking piece reminds us of protocols spelled out in the Iroquois Constitution. Council deliberations have no time limit. Everyone gets a chance to talk, and no one is allowed to dominate. A 2012 video by Friedman takes us into Oakland's MetWest High School, where restorative justice circles are organized by students for peer-to-peer -peer support. It's good to see that according to LinkedIn, the teacher who supervised the process back in 2012 is still working for the district today. When Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged a sense of somebodyness, we should be careful to consider how he was not invoking the ideology of individualism. His favorite sermon, Three Dimensions of a Complete Life, encouraged reverence for that push forward, which requires individual effort. That is what he calls the first dimension of a complete life. But the second dimension, 
like the restorative justice circle, connects that forward push to our relationships with others. Sanitation workers who carried signs saying, I am a man, were not invoking any ideological individualism. They were saying that their work, their voice, and their life deserved full recognition. They were asking that a broken circle be made whole. They were inviting us to listen. Somebodyness is a kind of individualism, but it's not the ideological kind. King somebodyness is practiced with Ubuntu. It is the first dimension of a complete life, not the only dimension. Furthermore, our insight into somebodyness can be deepened by attention to Curry's work on black male vulnerability. King's refusal to condemn rioters was an outgrowth of his insistence that we have not done enough to condemn the condition that instigate riots. A riot is like a broken circle and broken circles have histories. Our attention to King's somebodyness may also help us to stop saying some things about King himself as if he were a lone hero of some kind. We need to insist upon his connectedness to his brother, A.D., to his sister, Christine, to Reverend Ralph Abernathy, to Andrew Young, to Coretta Scott, and many others. Finally, in my philosophical approach to somebodyness, I prefer to steer away from Descartes' dictum, I think, therefore I am. Instead, I prefer to Thich Nhat Hanh, where I find myself breathing in. In fact, just as a side note, uh, breathing in is what helped me last night transform my own experience from one of outrage and tears and screaming at the um, revelation of the death of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I just had to remind myself to take a breath. In this presentation, I have gathered a philosophical approach to restorative justice that converses with the work of Fannie Davis, Tommy Curry, Frank Wilderson, Carl Sudler, Eric Butler, Ralph Bunch, Judith Butler, Cassidy Friedman, Freud, Marx, Fanon, Descartes, Hobbes, Locke, Enrique Dussel, the Popol Vuh, the Iroquois Constitution, and Martin Luther King Jr. The practice of restorative justice circles is a series of experiments in practical truth that restores the recognition of our somebodyness as a vulnerability in relationship to those who love us and structures that do not. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. That was very, very interesting. A lot of wonderful threads that I can't wait to pick up in our discussion afterwards. We'll turn to Sanjay for the final presentation of the panel. I hope uh, everybody can hear me all right. Uh, I'm uh, glad to go after Anthony and Greg. I feel like my uh, paper uh, is a good uh, segue from uh, the points that, that were just made. Uh, as um, uh, I, I had been introduced earlier as uh, Sanjay Lal, I'm a senior lecturer of philosophy at Clayton State University and also uh, an associate editor of uh, ACORN Philosophical Studies pacifism and nonviolence. Uh, last year I published uh, the monograph Gandhi's Thought and Liberal Democracy. Some of uh, my uh, points today will uh, uh, kind of follow from uh, that, that work. Uh, more uh, recently I uh, edited a volume called Peaceful Approaches for a More Peaceful World that uh, next year should be published by, by Brill. Uh, I, I'd like to begin by directing our attention today to uh, a little discussed paradox that I see uh, underlying so much of the work that peace and justice activists engage in. Uh, to try and give a summary of what I have in mind, this work seeks to rectify injustices that can be said to result from a lack of institutional and in, in individual respect afforded to certain members of the moral community. Yet the inherent value and dignity of moral community members is never contingent on how they're regarded by outside institutions and individuals. Indeed, it clearly seems that the most revered examples of peace and justice activism involve just those activists who most definitively affirm this insight. Uh, this has been a, uh, a rough year, as we all know, and we, we 
lost many great giants, but to take uh, one notable and timely example, uh, in praising Congressman John Lewis, former President Barack Obama said in his eulogy, he and other young men and women sat at a segregated lunch counter, well-dressed, straight-backed, refusing to let a milkshake poured on their heads or a cigarette extinguished on their backs or a foot aimed at their ribs, refused to let that dent their dignity and their sense of purpose. Clearly, the former president saw much to admire and revere in Lewis's ability to affirm as well as maintain his own sense of self-worth in spite of the obvious lack of recognition other individuals and institutions around him gave to his place in the moral community. When we think of the great social reform heroes from Mahatma Gandhi to Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King to John Lewis, we can see that the above noted quality is common and seemingly ubiquitous among them. Uh, by refusing to allow their own conception of their moral standing to be affected by the intense, even unspeakable act of injustice they endured, these individuals showed a strength of character that is surely worthy of reverence, and indeed emulation by us all. Unquestionably, Lewis manifested a sense of somebodyness by remaining detached and unaffected while others overtly disrespected his worth as a human being. The paradox arises, however, when we consider that such morally laudable examples seemingly serve to undermine what basis there may be for rising up and protesting particular instances of injustice in the first place. After all, if the acts of disrespect and injustice that are the object of protest are actually incapable of impacting one's own sense of uh, worth and dignity, then it may seem like these acts are not really worth the trouble or even getting bothered by to begin with. To this point, uh, to put this point another way, if examples like the life of John Lewis show that the racism of institutions and individuals does not have to truly harm those who are on its receiving end, then it seems like we can question whether there is a, there is a point to investing ourselves to fighting uh, this racism in the first place. I want to argue that there is indeed a point for doing so. At the same time, I believe that the examples provided by those uh, like John Lewis during the lunch counter sit-ins should be followed by all who wish to rise up against the disrespect and injustice they are shown. Furthermore, I maintain that it would be ideal if all who protest acts of disrespect and injustice first took steps to develop the kind of character traits President Obama extols above uh, before they engage in activism. This particular conclusion perhaps better serves to clarify the tension I see, since one can reasonably wonder why a person who does not need others to give outward displays of respect and affirmation to keep her own sense of dignity intact would feel motivated to correct situations in which uh, such displays are not evident. If, as I hold, we should work to teach activists that they do not need external indications of acceptance from the outside world to affirm their own moral worth, are we undermining their very basis for caring about changing the lamentable mindset others within that institute or others within that world have? I would now like to introduce into our discussion the concept of Swaraj as it is understood by Mahatma Gandhi. The political connotations of this term, which translates to self-rule, has for India's independent uh, independence movement are obvious. Among scholars, it is well known that Swaraj has a much deeper and comprehensive meaning in Gandhi's thought than is commonly supposed. Two specific features of Gandhi's understanding of Swaraj are relevant to this discussion. One, individuals must first attain self-rule within themselves before the nation they're part of can have self-rule. Two, pursuit of genuine Swaraj precludes isolation from a wider society. In discussing his understanding of self-rule, Gandhi states, the root meaning of Swaraj is self-rule. Swaraj may therefore be rendered as disciplined rule from within. Independence has no such limitation. Independence may mean license to do as you like. Swaraj is positive. Independence is negative. The Swaraj is a sacred word, a Vedic word, meaning self-rule and self-restraint, not freedom from all restraints. Additionally, Gandhi states, if we become free, India is free. And in this thought, you have a definition of Swaraj. It is Swaraj when we learn to rule ourselves. It is therefore in the palm of our hands. Do not consider the Swaraj to be like a dream. Here there is no idea of sitting still. 
the Swaraj that I wish to picture before you and me is such that after we have once realized it, we will endeavor to the end of our lifetime to persuade others to do likewise. But such Swaraj has to be experienced by each one for himself. Gandhi's assertions above are predicated on a metaphysical conception of the self that is common within traditional Indian philosophy. Specifically, the notion of an all-pervading universal self that is identical with absolute reality underlies his words. For Gandhi, this self is one's true being, and Swaraj is ultimately the same as a state in which the true self is realized by the individual. For the purposes of our panel topic, I'll focus on what Gandhi's words imply about freedom for the individual. These points in turn will help illuminate important insights pertaining to pedagog pedagogy and restorative justice. Ultimately, in the process of seeking to give his illumination, I believe I can point to how the above paradox can be resolved. In reflecting on the paradox, it seems we can attribute much of its force to the particular conception of freedom that is commonly supposed within our culture. This conception is indeed evident when we consider what the justification may be for activists who engage in the specific acts of protest in which we engage in. When it is clear to us that someone's freedom is being denied, we can more readily see that there is a justified basis for protest. When making these kinds of judgments, however, it is problematic to ap apply a conception of freedom that accords with the dominant Western cultural supposition that freedom can be understood solely in terms of what it is not, in, in other words, neg negatively. Uh, the notion that freedom is equivalent to non-interference is a prevailing notion, both in Western political theory and in everyday discussions within modern Western society. We can see this notion to be in play in our assessments of acts of protest. We find these acts to be justified when we can see that they result from what we regard as unacceptable instances of interference in the light pursuit of others, particularly those who belong to groups that have been historically marginalized. Thus, when we say someone is kept from enjoying a meal in a public place, openly expressing affection toward another, we see that she is being denied freedoms and therefore justified in engaging in acts of protest. It is clear that a person in these kinds of situations is in fact justified in protesting. After all, such a person is kept from engaging in life pursuits that she sees as giving her life value. However, in keeping with Gandhi's statements, I believe it is a mistake to think the kinds of situations invoked here exhaustively illust uh, illustrate the value of freedom. To reiterate, independence may mean license to do as you like. Swaraj is positive, independence is negative. I want to argue that it would be behoove us to go beyond valuing non-interference and incorporate a notion of self-rule in our conception of freedom. When freedom is understood more in terms of developing the ability to align one's thoughts and actions with the deeper self, however this concept is understood, then we can in fact resolve the kind of tensions I discussed above. We can indeed now more clearly see our basis for so positively assessing the activism of those like John Lewis. By his actions, Representative Lewis demonstrated that he had already realized a very real, perhaps the only real kind of freedom and was illuminating the path by which others, including his opponents, could also attain genuine freedom. Moreover, the pedagogical value of his broader comprehension of freedom is rich in ways that cannot be said for more negative understandings of the notion. Consider after all that when freedom is conceived primarily as the ability to understand and follow the dictates of a deeper self, the connection character development has to the realization of freedom can be clearly seen. Thus it would follow that genuine promotion of freedom entails use of pedagogical techniques that aim to develop human character. What's more is that when we think of freedom in a way that accords with the Gandhian understanding discussed here, we become less inclined to immediately presume that those who perpetuate the unjust acts that activists protest are actually already free. As a result, rich implications follow for how we should go about rectifying acts of injustice. When the perpetrators of these acts are seen as impeding their own freedom, which would be the case for anyone who does not act in a way that aligns with the deeper self, the whole terrain in which activist struggles take place can be reconceived. Activists on the understanding of freedom put forth here can be seen as fighting for the freedom of their perceived oppressors not just their own freedom. As Gandhi showed, 
affirming one's worth and dignity when enduring acts that are intended to violate that very worth and dignity is an effective means of transforming the hearts and minds of opponents. To undergo such transforming experiences, it would seem necessarily uh, one would become more aware of and receptive to the cause of the deeper self, which would thus bring one to a freer state of being. Given these points, additionally rich implications follow for understanding how acts of injustice should be dealt with. If the perpetrators of such acts actually belie and impede their own freedom, it would seem that a correct response to what they have done would involve working to restore their inner ability to acknowledge and honor the rightful place the deeper self should have for them in motivating and guiding their own actions. Thus, we can revolutionize the dimensions of how the very notion of restorative justice should be conceived. The Gandhian framework of Swaraj provides us with a different way in which to interpret the acts of injustice which spark activist protest, and thus with a different way in which to think about what the correct response to these acts should be. If it is ultimately the case that particular acts of injustice result from the lack of self-rule within the perpetrators of these acts, then it would follow that seeking to restore or at least establish such rule to these acts. After all, when those who are on the receiving end of unjust acts demonstrate inner swaraj, they are in the best position to inspire their opponents to allow the deeper self that is also within them to guide and rule. A world in which inner swaraj has been collectively or even widely realized would seem to be a world in which justice can be advanced much more fully than a world in which the sole focus of those who respond to acts of injustice is on correcting the particular unevenness that is instantiated in a given act. Okay, uh, for my uh, last uh, part of this presentation, I, I uh, just like to um, admit that my analysis doesn't seem uh, to do justice, so to speak, to our in intuition that external freedoms, like the kind instantiated when members of marginalized groups uh, can sit wherever they like in restaurants, is very important to us. Uh, we value such freedom in a way that clearly shows that we regard it as essential to our well-being. If, however, genuine freedom does not depend on whatever external freedoms we are granted by others, then it would seem to follow that the importance we give to external freedoms, to put it mildly, is, is uh, misplaced. This is the case even if we think of the struggles for external freedom as above all liberating those who perpetuate acts of oppression. Uh, I'll attempt uh, briefly to adequately address this concern. Ultimately, it's my view that external freedom is best regarded as a kind of worthwhile addition to the life of one who has attained self-rule. Attainment of self-rule, however, should be taken as necessary, though perhaps not entirely sufficient for well-being. Furthermore, it is plausible to conclude that without genuine self-rule, external freedom by itself can have no great value and is actually conducive to engendering morally regrettable states of affairs. The examples that abound in both the contemporary world and throughout history of free people having little regard for responsibility adequately substantiate this point. What's more is that even though the denial of external freedom is commonly a strong motivator for social activism, there's no reason to suppose that pursuit of this freedom can ever truly be worthwhile if that pursuit does not include as an integral component the seeking of inner rule. Indeed, the challenges that confront the individual who pursues external freedom can legitimately be regarded as opportunities by which greater progress can be had in the quest for inner self rule. Without the latter, genuine self rule will always elude us. Okay, so those are all my uh, prepared remarks. I, I think I, I was able to finish on time, uh, which is a big accomplishment for me. Uh, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you to all of our panelists for their presentations and for this provocative way of thinking about somebodiness and the um, some of the themes that I'm hearing in the presentation are the um, essential nature of self-reflection and all three presentations being emphasized as um, an internal process, as something that is required in order to be able to even be at the table for restoration or for healing the harms that these various kinds of oppressions 
um, addressed uh, um, these various types of oppressions um, um, cast upon us. So um, I know that there are people like Swasti here who have tremendous insights into both uh, many of the topics that we talked about and perhaps um, Lavanya also has some insights. Uh, I'll open it up to questions. There are none in the chat so far, um, but I'll open it up to um, any questions or comments that any of our um, people present would like to contribute, and then perhaps we can move into a discussion. Not to put you on the spot, Swasti, but like so many things that were talked about here fit within your wheelhouse. <laughs> I think you should start us off. And I'm happy to. I just want to make sure, uh, Lavanya, or is it Oscar, if you have questions or comments that you want to put forth? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Oscar Guana. Um, I am a second year MDiv student at uh, Boston University. I am currently taking the Spirit and Art of Conflict Transformation class with Dr. Olson. And um, <clears throat> so she was the one introducing us to the PGSA and, and well, to all the conference. So um, I am Colombian. I am in Bogota right now in South America. And um, I was just thinking uh, about our own inner conflict in our country. And uh, th there's one difference um, from the scenarios and contexts the panelists just described. And um, I was just thinking about that. In, in the US, the realities of the, uh, slavery and racism is between you know the, the black citizens and, and white citizens and in the case of candy it was the indians protesting the uh english so there's this otherness to the oppressor right but in our case here in colombia for example we are having uh soldiers and police killing people innocent people uh but they are just the same same ethnicity, same nationality, um, same class even. Um, so I just wanted to put that on the table and maybe ask the panelists how this context, what nuances the, uh, does this reality or this different context um, uh, 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 introduce to your understanding of uh, somebody's and restorative justice um cases in which you know people are oppressing and killing their own people uh, where otherness is maybe not just not that um evident or or deep so to say so thank you thank you great great presentation thank you very much Thank you, Oscar, for your question. It's a great way to start us off to think about this nature. When we think about systems of oppression, we often think about the structures of identity. And you um, are bringing up this issue of discrepancies of power. Would anyone like to take a go at answering Oscar's question? Oh, Anthony? Yeah. You need to unmute. Okay, so now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, so my my biggest concern, and it's for a project that I'm working on now, is um, this idea of uh, uh, Lewis Gordon talks about uh, the geography of reason, and so I'm looking at um, something that I'm I'm referring to as a geography of of freedom, right? That, the, that there are these discussions and ideas of freedom that come out of this group of black people that were in this moment from 1896 to 1975, right? Which is post-slavery, but still in that Jim Crow era. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is uh, in this particular paper, what I'm trying to put forward is that there were ideas for anyone who's facing oppression that there's a certain type of existential transformation 
uh, that uh, reason brings to the fore that they have to go through. It doesn't matter whether the oppressor is a person uh, that's like you or a person that is different, that, that these types of existential uh, transformation are necessary such that you can be equal to the oppression itself. And also, um, one of the points that I had to hit pretty quickly uh, at the end was that, you know, we get on the conversation of, of, of reparation, and I really wanted to reframe the discussion of reparation, not in monetary sense. Uh, the, my biggest concern was um, what, um, what does living in an oppressive society whether there's the oppressor the oppressor is the other or whether the oppressor is like you what types of 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 moral quandaries does that does that bring about and and i took that example from people who live in like homes where the parents were alcoholics or or they live in an abusive home usually they the first thing that happens once that they're removed from the abuse and things of that nature all of the people go to counseling Right. But in the United States, we seem to be talking about um, reparations of just one group. And, and I think that we need to talk about reparations of, of whites or the oppressor themselves. So I think that that would apply whether I was in uh, Colombia or whether I was in the United States, that if you want to get to a moment where uh, the oppression, the way in which we understand oppression is removed, then you have to get to a point where the, the person who has been the oppressor now has to reframe how, what, what things have I learned in that oppressive moment that causes me to overlook certain moral quandaries. Um, so that's my answer. Thank you. Yeah, this, this issue of um, reflection and existential transformation um, those are those are important scaffolding for us to look at for how tr how transformation occurs. The question is how do we get people to the point of coming to the table? You know that's always the question in peace yeah. and in conflict resolution work. Um, more specifically, is um, we have all of the roadmaps of what needs to change. Maybe we don't. What we need is to figure out how to get people to come to well, the table and be willing so to be. Right. But so one point in the paper that I, 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 like I said, I wanted to get some stuff out, right? But one point in the paper that I was really ins uh, insisting on is this point that King and Thurman both felt, and, and, and I don't know that they take this from Gandhi. I'm not a big believer that they take most of their ideas from Gandhi. Um, I think they take some from Gandhi. But, but Gandhi seems to believe this also, is that uh, the, the, this type of, of, of commitment to um, a, a non-oppressive moment by one person is infectious, right? So, so that moment when that one person starts and then the community starts, right? It's just like social networking, right? You get the, the, the first individual, then you get a, the two that create the first node or whatever. It's the same thing. That, that moment of resistance, that, that, that ability to say no, right? It, it's infectious. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Greg or Sanjay, would you like to comment on Oscar's question? Uh, I, I would just in, encourage Oscar to, to maybe test the relevance of um, the, the notion of the broken circle uh, that, that I made in my presentation. Could, could the, uh, the violence uh, be, be analyzed that way? Where is the broken circle? And, and how much of the broken circle is attributable to these, um, uh, to these constructions of the other, such that the person perpetrating the violence is the human um, and, and the other is somehow threatening their humanity. Uh, so I would be interested to know, you know, if, if those frameworks uh, that were so helpful in understanding Oakland uh, might be helpful in understanding uh, Columbia. Thank you. Sanjay? Uh, yeah, I, I would just uh, say that I think Oscar's uh, question kind of goes along with uh, what I was trying to get across that uh, if there's not a, a real degree of inner freedom attained, uh, then regardless of what uh, uh, group an individual might might belong to, uh, they'll they'll oppress because they they'll not really have the the freedom within themselves. And you know, I, I think this goes along with what Anthony was saying too. That it's when uh, you, you really attain liberation uh, within yourself as an individual that 
it, it can be infectious. And, and my understanding is that Gandhi did, did have that view, uh, that purification of oneself, he says, numerous times leads to purification of the world around you. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments? Swasti, do you have anything you want to toss into here? Yeah, um, I appreciated all your papers. This, the whole idea of, of identity and reflection is so important. And you all touched on that in different ways. And, and one thing when you were talking about the sign of I am a man, right? The, and then you said um, how that wasn't so much as focusing on the individualism as you know, identifying who you are. It was interesting. I, I gave a talk on cultural humility, which talks about um, the difference of how with cultural competency versus cultural humility. And humility focuses on how the individual presents, right? And that the physician or the person interacting with them isn't trying to categorize them. Oh, you're Hindu or you're Buddhist or you're Jamaican. It's, oh, you're a person. Let me take this individual. And somebody asked me, they said, but by definition, culture is communal. And so you're emphasizing this individual. But it's funny because my work does stem from grounded in, in Hinduism and in, in um, Indian context, where you don't start with the individual. And you know, it's the presumed is the collective. And I, I kind of got called out on that. And so it was really interesting for me to have to back backtrack and think about why am I not seeing it that way? And then I, as you all were talking, I'm like, that's what was wrong. That not wrong. That's the, the mistake I made that I was presuming the collective, the connection, and then focusing on that individual, which, you know, being clear on that when we talk to other people is, is important. Um, and that whole, you cannot have that without self-awareness, you can't have transformation. And all of you touched on that and it's just so important. And so thank you for that. And you've given me more ways to talk about that as I move forward. And can I say um, something I on did, that point? Please. I, I hate to, I hate to interrupt you, but I, I this no, is, no, no. Uh -oh. all right. So Thurman has a book called The Luminous Darkness, right? And in the book, he says that um, he, that the burden of being white and the burden of being black was so heavy that he had not met a person uh, that knew what it was to be human outside of those contexts, right? So, so there's a moment where he's in Canada and he meets a guy who, uh, Thurman uses the word Indian, but he, he means Native American or Native Canadian. Let me say that, Indigenous Canadian or whatever. But anyway, he says, so, so do you recognize yourself, and I'm using the language of Thurman, do you recognize yourself as an Indian or do you recognize yourself as a Canadian? Right? And this really forms and changes how I think of myself as even, I, how do I identify as black? And I always tell people, hey, if you need me to identify as that, hey, and that works easier for you, then I'm, I'm willing to do that. Right? But, but, but the guy answers Thurman and he, he says, um, he says, I, I come from the place where um, the mountains, uh, at, the, at the foothill of the mountains where the ice and the, and the water runs from, from at the end of the winter, the water runs down from the snow. He says, I, in, the, in the summer times, I live with the wolves. And in, in the winter time, and he names some bird and I live with them. And he says, we live together and we learn to coexist. He says, these things that you speak of, the Canadian or the Indian, I know nothing of, right? And I started thinking of myself in that kind of terms. I'm, a, I'm just a child of the South, right? I, I love uh, those places that are along I-20. And so, and I think of myself in this particular moment, right? And that's a communal way of, of understanding yourself, but it's a way of trying to get at what does it mean to be something outside of these kinds of, of, of context that get thrown on us without us even having an, under, an understanding of what they actually mean. Yeah, that's good. And one of you, I think, Amanda, you might have mentioned that the issue that I have and with all that we've said is how do we take this to the people that are not in the choir? And, you know, when you were talking about that infectiousness and, you know, I think about Gandhi and Vinoba. Vinoba Bhave is the one I've been working with and he was a disciple, spiritual successor to Gandhi. And both of them have a profound commitment to the idea that human, 
humans are good or at least have that potential for goodness. And when Vinoba was doing his Budan Yatra, where he was walking all over India to collect land for the landless, Naran Bhai Desai was one of his disciples. And he's like, I can't do this. He goes, you see God in people. And he goes, I don't know that that exists. And I don't know how to do that. And Vinoba says, you don't have to see God. He said, just try to find the goodness in everybody. And he says, that's all you need to do. Don't worry about your faith in God. And I like that idea because it's like, we can always try to find the goodness in everybody, right? And as opposed to saying everybody is good, because we've all met people that you're just like, well, even right now with what's going on. I mean, it's like, what happened to integrity? What happened to fairness? And I get so angry. And then it's like, you've got to look for the goodness and that's hard to do. But how do you get, Mitch McConnell to do that. And I don't know, but the thing that keeps me going, and this is Gandhi and Vinoba as well, is non-attachment. You know, you do what you gotta do, and then you just let go of the results, whether they work or not, not our problem. You know, when Vinoba walked for 14 years all over India, in the end, some crit critics are saying, oh, that was unsuccessful. You only collected four and a half million acres. You know, the goal was of originally 50 and then it was, you know, um, came down to thir three, 32 million acres they wanted to get. Well, they got four and a half. So yeah, I guess that's a failure, you know, but you know, but you just didn't care. And, you know, I, I yeah. interviewed these people that walked with him and it's hilarious because it kind of, you know, you can picture this skinny guy robed in a white, loincloth walking with the stick into the village and then he opens up the thing you guys give land or you don't and then he's leaving and there's all this chaos behind him and he's like that's not my problem my problem was to offer the uh, offer the opportunity so for us i still ask myself how do i get to the the ones that aren't in the choir and if they don't hear me but then i have to say well i have to do what i can and we do these kind of conversations and hopefully you know, we can, can reach it out beyond that. But we do what we can I, and let it go. I think it's important for us to have these conversations. But but I, I don't want to confuse the conversations with uh, radical revolutionary acts, right? And and I'm always critical of, of, of my friends who are philosophers that consider themselves revolutionaries because they're having radical conversations as opposed to doing radical actions, right? And I'm nervous about that. Uh, and, and in order to do the radical kind of action, you, you take a Gandhi or you take a, a, a King or, uh, you know, any of these guys, right? The first thing you have to do is give up uh, the, the, the fear of death. That's, 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 pre, that's preeminent because once, and then whatever the story is, whether it's you Christian, you Hindu, whatever the story is that you need to do to give up that, 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 because, the action that uh, may be necessary may require death. And, and that, that's, that's tough, right? Uh, you know, there, there are many points where, where Gandhi could have died, right? And, and, and does die toward the end after, you know, uh, he's an older man and then King, 39, he's dead, right? And, and you, have to, you have to give up that, you know, that's one of the things I pick up from Thurman. That once you get past that, there is nothing that the oppressor can take from you. Yeah, so and exactly. I like that, Spasti. Yes, yes, it is. It is the ultimate detachment. Yes. Uh, yeah, and and to go along uh, with with that, uh, I, I've noticed in Gandhi, uh, even though he he does have a an unyielding faith in the goodness of of humanity, there also seems to be uh, this. Uh, this kind of realism where I think uh, he understands that it's not so much the, the particular uh, uh, leaders uh, who need to be swayed, but uh, just enough of uh, the masses and, and without cooperation from the masses, then uh, no matter how, how corrupt individual leaders might be, they're, they're not gonna be able to um, you know, carry on their objectives. Uh, so when I try and think in terms of uh, maybe this general goodness of, of most people, as opposed to trying to think of, of every single person uh, as being good and pure on the inside, it, it becomes 
was was daunting is how I would put it. And and I take that to be a a, a sort of an answer to the to the McConnell question, right? Um, yeah. be, because for King. And for restorative justice circles, I mean, you have the center of action that 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 you can control and participate in. And so, um, I mean, the answer is to flip the Senate. Right, and just like in conflict resolution processes, where there's a requirement for a willingness to participate in um, in restorative justice circles in the circle process, there's also an ethic of um, accountability. And so, when we start looking at political figures and we start looking at complicated conflicts, such as the one that Oscar described in Colombia, we don't necessarily have people who are capable of stepping into the process of accountability or willing to let go of the power that holds them apart from the process. And, and if I could follow up on that, I think that the discussion along these lines has then um, helped me to understand why uh, Fania Davis includes the, uh, the process of the, the, the Truth Commission, right? Because it's it's the Truth Commission that requires uh, people to be at the table. So that may be one of the, the, the sort Perfect. of the intrinsic values of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The carrot and the stick, you know, in all of these processes, we have carrots and sticks. Um, Lavanya, is, yeah, we haven't heard from you. Do you have any questions or is that too cruel for me to ask you since you're our intern? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that it was definitely a pleasure to listen to all three of you today. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insights and uh, philosophical, philosophical ideologies with us. Uh, it was definitely, I think, as Amanda mentioned earlier, um, a wealth of information in a really short amount of time. And as someone who doesn't really have a significant philosophical background, I actually think this is a great start for me to be able to delve further into the research. Um, I know uh, listening to all of you, I think Swasti and Sanjay have a lot of background in um, uh, studying in research with the Indian subcontinent, and I'd actually be really interested in exploring practices in that area with Hinduism and Buddhism. And so, uh, yeah, I'd love to um, hear anything, maybe uh, hear anything you have to say now, and of course, do my own research on my own time, or if you have any recommendations for where I could start. That would be awesome as well. Jump in, inquiring minds, Swasti, <laughs> Sanjay. Uh, well, my first recommendation would, would be to start with uh, Gandhi's autobiography if you're looking for uh, like kind of a, a standard sort of Indian story. I mean, just uh, his his context uh, by which he becomes uh, the, the Mahatma within uh, uh, Indian uh, society. Uh, it's nicely told with, in his own words in his autobiography, and uh, I think you can clearly get um, the the sense of how his key key ideas originated uh, that guided all of his work from looking at his autobiography, the story of my experiments with truth. Thank you. Did you say you were doing ethics and? Yeah, I'm kind of focused more on um, human rights and peace and conflict resolution. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, one thing that Anthony or was it Greg that said the idea of not keeping this just philosophical, right? Because you can have a great philosophy and then treat people horribly. So I consider myself an applied ethicist. So, you know, I take those ideas and then so then what does that mean for how we choose to live? Um, I put my Gmail, my email account in the chat box. So then we can talk anytime. I mean, my current work, I'm looking, doing a lot with Vinoba and there's a community of women in India that I've been spending a lot of time with. And, um, you know, they, they're, they don't call themselves peace activists or environmentalists or feminists, but that's how they live. You know, and so it's kind of interesting to, to bring those ideas in and look, but I'd be glad to talk to you anytime. Yeah, I would love that. Thank you. Yeah. He's actually writing a book about it. And so it'd be great to have 
a, a willing ear to share those ideas with, I'm sure. I'll speak for her. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah, I've left my email address also if anyone's Thank you. interested Thank you. in further communication. Beautiful. Thank you all. Thanks for your participation and for bringing your curiosity to uh, a lively discussion. Um, there are multiple um, other sessions. I hope you'll check out the PGSA website to see what other sessions, as I say, going all the way through November, including um, a restorative circle that we're going to be offering after the um, elections to bring people together into a conversation around restoration, uh, to address the issues of polarization that are certainly present prior to the election, um, and we have no doubt will also be present after the election. So um, please do peruse the offerings and join us for another session. It's been wonderful speaking with you all today, and thank you again to the panelists for sharing the brilliance of your research and your thoughts with us and for the questions that were posed as a way to um, enliven the conversation even further and animate the information that these scholars bring to us. So thank you all for <clears throat> being part of today's conversation and I look forward to seeing you in future PGSA conference sessions. Thank you. Thank you, good to thank see you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, good to see you, Greg. Thank you. Okay, so 